Homozygous inbred lines are the basis of hybrid maize breeding. Crossing two unrelated inbred lines leads to high yielding hybrid varieties. Hybrid varieties exploit the phenomenon of heterosis and have been highly successful in boosting agricultural production worldwide. Traditionally, inbred lines are formed by continuous self pollination for six to eight generations. Each generation, the line's vigor is reduced due to inbreeding depression. The duration of this inbreeding process determines the progress achieved in a maize breeding program. A new method speeds up inbred line development and is currently revolutionizing maize breeding and research, the doubled haploid technique. This technique centers on an inducer genotype, which, when used as a pollinator, triggers pollinated female flowers to produce kernels with haploid embryo. Although these special haploid inducers were discovered in the 1950s, it has only been in the last decade that suitable protocols have been developed for complementary steps such as haploid identification and artificial chromosome doubling. Today, the in vivo haploid induction technique is routinely used in maize for large-scale DH line development in both the public and the private sector. The major advantages of the doubled haploid or DH technique are first, DH lines are completely uniform after only two cropping cycles. Second, because of this complete uniformity, the visual differences between individual DH lines are much clearer than between traditionally developed F3 or F4 families. Therefore, it is easier for breeders to make their selection decisions. Doubled haploid production, also called DH production, requires four steps. 1. Inducing haploids. 2. Identifying kernels with a haploid embryo. 3. Doubling haploids chromosomes. And 4. Self-pollinating doubled plants. The first step is the induction cross. Inducers are specific lines that can induce haploidy. Simit uses inducers that are equipped with a dominantly inherited purple color marker expressed in the stalk and the kernels aluron and scutellum. The latter two are used as endosperm and embryo markers respectively to distinguish kernels with haploid or diploid embryos. Technicians collect pollen from the haploid inducers. This pollen is then used to pollinate the female flowers of the donor plants. The donor years are harvested. Some kernels will contain haploid embryos with only the donor parent's chromosomes. The majority, however, will be normal crossing kernels with diploid embryos. These diploid embryos contain chromosomes from both the donor and the inducer parent. Normal crossing kernels are of no value for DH line production. The ratio between haploid and crossing kernels is variable. The induction rate is the number of haploid kernels divided by the total number of kernels harvested. For example, an induction rate of 10% means that an ear with 300 kernels bears 30 kernels with haploid embryos. An induction rate of 8 to 10% is common among currently employed inducer genotypes. The second step is distinguishing between kernels with haploid and diploid embryos. This step requires a reliable phenotypic identification system. At CIMIT, we use a visual seed identification system. The system is based on the dominantly inherited purple coloration of the kernels scutellum and aluron, which act as embryo and endosperm markers. Seed classification based on this system is easy to learn and requires no special equipment. CIMID distinguishes between three kernel categories. Category 1 contains kernels with non-colored embryo and non-colored endosperm. These may have resulted from pollen contaminations or color inhibition. Category 2 contains all normal crossing kernels. Both embryo and endosperm have purple color. This results from the dominantly inherited coloration present in the inducers. Category 3 represents the kernels with haploid embryo. The colored endosperm indicates that they are the result of an induction cross, but the non-colored embryo signifies that the embryos contain only donor genome. A typical relationship between the three categories looks like this. On the left is a minuscule portion of contamination kernels. 
The small quantity indicates a well-performed pollination with inducer pollen. Next is a large bag of F1 kernels. 90 to 95 percent of all kernels harvested may belong to this group. The percentage depends on the inducer employed. Next are the haploids. Only this group will be used in double haploid line development. A disadvantage, however, is that the marker system does not work in all genetic backgrounds. For example, donors that have purple colored kernels cannot be subjected to this color marker. Also, inhibitor genes may prevent color expression. The third step is the artificial chromosome doubling of the haploids. Here one copy of each chromosome is made so that the resulting plants are diploids and homozygous. Colchicine is a plant alkaloid. It works as a mitotic inhibitor. Mitosis is the process of nucleus division in somatic cells. After DNA replication, the microtubules pull the duplicated chromatids towards the two poles. The cell then divides into two daughter cells. Colchicine disrupts mitosis by binding to tubulin. In this way, the formation of microtubules and the polar migration of chromosomes is inhibited. The result is a single cell with doubled chromosome number. A fungicide treatment is applied to the kernels and they are placed in trays for germination. Each tray should be clearly labeled with an entry number. The trays are covered with slightly perforated aluminium foil to simulate darkness. Subsequently, the kernels are allowed to germinate for two to three days. The germination room is kept at a temperature of approximately 26 degrees Celsius and moderate humidity. The trays are checked daily and moisture is applied if necessary. The seedlings are ready for colchicine treatment once the coleoptile is approximately 2 cm. Mash bags and plastic labels are prepared. Seedlings with the correct coleoptile length are taken from the tray. The tips of these seedlings are cut to ensure greater penetration of the colchicine. Seedlings are grouped into one mesh bag based on their entry number. Mesh bags containing the prepared seedlings are placed into a custom-made steel tank. Tap water is added to the tank until all seedlings are well submerged. The water from the tank is then transferred to a measuring container to estimate the amount of colchicine solution necessary for this batch of seedlings. Staff working with colchicine must follow extreme safety measures. They must wear protective clothing, gloves and respiratory masks at all times. An electric pump transports the colchicine automatically into the steel tank and minimizes human contact with this toxic agent. Employing a timer allows the treatment to start and stop automatically, for example, during the night. After the treatment, the solution is emptied from the tank into specially designated waste containers. The seedlings are then rinsed with tap water. Residuals are also collected in special containers. All colchicine waste is later disposed of by an authorized company. The treated seedlings are transplanted into pots filled with soil. Special care must be taken to avoid damage during this process. They are kept in the greenhouse for several days. Various types of pots can be used. This type of pot is common in greenhouse experiments and horticulture. It is made of durable plastic and can be reused for many cycles. This pot is made of biodegradable material. Because it decays in the soil, this type of pot can be directly transplanted, enabling the use of a planting machine. The cheapest option is planting into a styrofoam cup, more commonly used for coffee or tea. All pots must have perforated bottoms to allow for drainage of excess water. Approximately two weeks after treatment, they are now ready to be transplanted to the field. Manual transplanting involves using wooden poles to prepare holes for the pots, distributing the pots along the row, and covering them with soil. This method is labor-intensive and time-consuming. Because of the large scale of the DH activities, Simit now transplants using a planting machine. This machine consists of a two-row vegetable planter with rotating cones. As the cones rotate, an individual pot is delivered into the soil. The operation requires one tractor driver, two machine operators, and two workers supplying plants to the machine. 
With this machine, 6,000 seedlings can be planted in three hours. Manually transplanting the same number of seedlings would require eight hours and 15 field workers. The fourth and final step in the production of DH lines is self-pollination and harvest of seeds. Colchicine treated plants are called D0 and contain a unique genotype. If the colchicine doubling treatment succeeds, selfing D0 plants should produce D1 seeds. This D1 seed constitutes the newly developed completely homozygous doubled haploid inbred line. Many D0 plants produce a limited number of seeds, sometimes as low as one. Because of this low harvest, years are collected with husks and kept inside their original pollination bags to minimize loss of seeds during handling. For identification purposes, ears of one entry are grouped into labeled mesh bags. The bags are then taken to the warehouse. In the warehouse, the ears are carefully de-husked. Ears are labeled and individually placed into mesh bags to await post-harvest treatment for insect control. Simit's current success rate for creating D1 seed is 3 to 5 percent. This means that only 3 to 5 percent of all haploid kernels of an entry will become a DH line. Several factors influence this success rate. One factor is accuracy of the haploid identification system. Misclassification increases the rate of crossing progeny in the D0 nursery. These false or F1 plants can be easily identified within the D0 nursery. They are vigorous and may contain many tillers. They also produce a high amount of pollen on a highly branched large tassel. Often they exhibit a purple colored stalk inherited from the inducer parent. In contrast, D0 plants are short, weak, and produce little pollen. Another factor is the efficiency of the chromosome doubling system. Typically, colchicine does not uniformly or completely double the cells of a plant. The result may be manifold, especially on the male flowering organ. Some tassels will produce abundant pollen, making selfing easy. Others will exhibit few tassel branches carrying fertile anthers. Lastly, some tassels will have limited pollen producing anthers or none at all. In such cases, selfing might be impossible and the genotype is lost. Additionally, favorable agronomic conditions affect seed production. A station's best lots should be allocated to the D0 nursery. Light soils, reliable irrigation facilities and good fertilization help DH plants survive. It should be noted that in vitro methods also exist for double haploid line production. This method may involve anthoculture combined with chromosome doubling. The in vivo approach, however, is the method currently favored in maize breeding and research. Successful implementation of the in vivo haploid induction technique for DH line production in any maize breeding or research program depends on the availability of 1. A haploid inducer genotype with high ability to induce haploids when crossed to diverse donor material, independent of environmental conditions. 2. An effective, standardized identification system for distinguishing haploid and diploid progeny. 3. A spontaneous or artificial chromosome doubling process to facilitate self-pollination and consequently maintenance of double haploid line seed. By crossing two or more of the resulting doubled haploid lines, breeders can rapidly develop new hybrid or open pollinated maize varieties. This technology, therefore, promises to reduce costs and speed the development of better adapted maize for resource-poor farmers in the world's toughest environments.